now, but we want to have that capability demonstrated. And it would test out our ability to fly beyond the Earth-Moon system and test out this hardware. And it's a key step in getting ready to go to Mars. Here is another uh, uh, image of a larger object, and there's the, the uh, CEV, and there's the space station for scale. There's some big ones out there. Uh, the third component, I think, that's necessary for preparing for long-term base on Mars is having a long-term base on the moon. Here is the current NASA plan for a base on the edge of Shackleton Crater. Uh, you get a sense of the, the, of the size here by noting that these are football fields put down for scale, 100 football fields. This is the standard unit now that we're using. Um, we, don't, we decided feet are not good, meters are not good, so everything is now done in units of football fields. <laughs> so uh, maybe if we join with ESO, there'll be soccer fields. It's Australian rules football. <laughs> uh, and here's what a base might look like. Uh, let me just go to, this slide doesn't want to show. I want to go to the point why the moon? Why some say the moon? Uh, I think we should go to the moon to stay. Often you hear people say, well, we got to go to the moon and learn something and then leave and we make sure to have an exit strategy. I think that's the wrong approach. We don't need an exit strategy. We need to have a permanent strategy. The hard thing to do is not to go, it's to stay, both for Mars and the moon. We know how to go to the moon. We've gone there. What we haven't done is stayed there. And we know how to go to Mars now, but we don't know how to stay there. And my point is we need to learn how to stay. We're going to learn how to stay on the moon. We also will learn how to do things that will prepare us for Mars, but it's not a literal preparation. The goal of a moon base should be a goal, a moon base should be a goal in itself. I can't imagine that we can consider ourselves a spacefaring civilization if we don't have a base on our nearest neighbor, just like we have bases in Antarctica. Not that I personally would be interested in going to this base. There's, that's not my science. But there's lots of people who find rocks interesting. They can go. Right? Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing to do. And this brings me to the philosophical point. I grew up on Star Trek, the original series, of course, and I was always enamored by the to boldly go. But I realized that we've got the wrong verb. The verb that we need is not to go. Going is easy. The verb we need is stay. The challenge of space is not to go, is not to go. It's time for a change of verb. We need to boldly stay. If you look at what we've done in space, uh, this whole list of things, they've come and gone. Getting there was easy. Making them stay was hard. They've, they're all, well, here's the last Saturn V parked in the front of the lawn. There's the Apollo astronauts. There's Skylab, Mir. Getting them up there was relatively easy. Having them stay has been impossible. NASA's got a tradition of thinking that missions have a, or projects have a five, ten year lifetime, and then that's it. You throw them away and do something else. Uh, so yes, we are, we could go to Mars. There's lots of designs that show we could go to Mars, but we're not ready to stay on Mars. We'll end up doing what we've done before, boldly go and then stop and come back, and that's it. What I want to say is we need to boldly stay, and how do we do that? Well, an example of the one place where we have learned to stay, I think, and there's a good model that we want to apply to Mars, is the Antarctic. South Pole Station, shown here, has been operating for 50 years uh, continuously. There's no, it's not a settlement. There's no maternity wards or elementary schools at South Pole. But there have been Americans in this space for 50 years, and last year, we did the ribbon cutting ceremony on the new station, shown here, and it has a 30 year lifetime, design lifetime. So 50 years in the past, 30 years in the, that's an 80 year window on South Pole. That's what I mean by staying. So it was operated for 50 years, mandated by national interest, geopolitical interest. It's a government owned facility, obviously, but it's operated by contractor keep the cost down. It was originally operated by the Navy when it was first put in and is now operated by Raytheon Polar Services. Uh, it's science-driven research. Although it's mandated by the government, by national interest and geopolitical interactions with the Antarctic Treaty, what we do there is only science. Science and only science. 
It's completely science-driven with peer peer-reviewed proposal selection, and there's enormous competition to do science there. And after 50 years, Antarctica is still interesting. I predict that after 50 years, the moon would still be interesting. After 100 years, Mars would still be interesting. These are natural places with natural complexity waiting to be discovered. There will be a lot of interesting discoveries on the moon and on Mars. On the moon, they will deal with the rocks and geology and history of the solar system. That's great science. On Mars, they'll deal with searching for evidence of life, as I showed you earlier. In my view, that's even more interesting science. So what do, we, what do we have to learn on the moon? We have to learn how to operate a base for years on end in terms of technology, in terms of human factors, in terms of life support, in terms of operation. The most important lesson we have to learn on the moon is how to transition from an exploration base, which may take an enormous fraction of NASA's budget, to a mature base, which becomes a small part of the overall budget. A moon base should be operated in perpetuity, and it should take no more than 20% of NASA's budget to do that. Right? That's going to be a hard lesson. We're going to have to go to a contractor-operated base transportation. SpaceX should fly us to, to the moon, not, uh, not NASA, and so on. And it should continue, as we see in Antarctica, peer-reviewed scientific research. So what I'm imagining is not a settlement, not a mining community, but a small research base that's government-funded. Scientists and graduate students go there. They do peer-reviewed research. The main product of such a base, such as the main product of Antarctica, is PhD theses. Uh, we continue to manage the program, and it persists for 50-plus years. My point is, is, the point is, is if on the moon, if we can't establish a long-term base on the moon that is done at a reasonable fraction of NASA's budget and a small fraction, and does it for 50 or 100 years, we can't do it on Mars. And that's what we need to do. So my conclusion is that we need to be thinking in this long-term mode, where we want to have a base on Mars for 50-plus years. That means we want to be able to know that we can do that for 50 plus years on the moon. It doesn't mean we wait 50 years after we go to the moon to start doing it on Mars. And we use the 50 plus years in Antarctica as a programmatic and operational model. And that's the end of the talk. <laughs> Question. This one. I can give you this one back. Uh, Chris, uh, as you know, uh, there is an infinite series of uh, preparatory activities that could be advocated to help get us ready to go to Mars. Uh, and if we allow these to be inserted into our programmatic uh, sequence, we will literally never get to Mars. Now, if we do deter, the only way to go to Mars is if you say our program is to go to Mars. Now, if you do that and you design a hardware set that is suitable for sending humans to Mars, you could, as a preliminary exercise with that hardware set, send humans to a near-Earth asteroid, because in fact there are no elements of, of a near-Earth asteroid mission um, that are extraneous, uh, that uh, in other words, you don't have to develop anything beyond the Mars hardware set to do a near-Earth asteroid mission. So, uh, in fact, you're not being diverted, you're just exercising a subset of your Mars hardware. You could even do a Mars sample return on that basis. For instance, if you're flying a Mars direct mission, you could just fly the ERV to Mars, make the propellant, and fly it back with a ton of samples. But uh, a lunar base is quite different. A lunar base requires developing a lot of extraneous hardware that is not needed to go to Mars. And to demonstrate that you can, quote, stay on the moon for long periods of time requires running a lunar-based program for a significant period of time before you initiate a Mars program. And so, in fact, such a commitment would prevent us from reaching Mars in our lifetime. The, so, really, there's a choice here. If, if you want to go to Mars, you got to go to Mars. If you want to learn to live and stay on Mars, you got to go and stay on Mars. 
the resource utilization technologies that are, will be practiced on Mars are completely different from those that would be practiced on